Hello, and welcome to episode 23 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. And this is John Denning in Los Angeles. Outstanding, John. How are things going today? Things are hectic today, um, but what's new? <laughs> what's new is it is hotter than blazes where I'm at. Yes. Uh, it's also new down here that it feels great outside. It's about 72, wow. I think, so. So I got the heat, and you got the temperate I've got region. the dream. Yeah, that's right. What are you drinking today? Uh, I've gone pretty simple, mostly because I'm out of most booze upstairs. Uh, I had gin, and I had some tonic. So I'm drinking a gin and tonic. <laughs> Any spe- uh, special kind of gin there, or is it just, you know, whatever? I- I'm going to feel like a fanboy in saying this, but you know what? I am kind of a fanboy. I'm drinking aviation gin, which, for those who don't know, uh, is Ryan Reynolds' gin company. Deadpool himself. The coolest guy on the planet? I don't know if he's the coolest. He's um, pretty cool. But yeah, he's right up there. <laughs> I like that dude. I got a lot of respect for that guy. How can you not? Yeah. How about you? Uh, since it is so hot here, it's about 100 degrees here today, I am drinking just rosé. <laughs> so something light and easy, nothing like heavy red. I'm not a huge white wine fan. This is uh, the rosé that we make, so it's yeah. it's pretty good. And it turns out that, of course, I have many, many bottles of it. So it's free to me, as they say. And yet somehow I have to pay for them. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's free for me. World. You pay. <laughs> <laughs> what a world. Uh, what's the song of the day? You know, this is a, an old-ish song, I think. Uh, I remember, I feel like I heard this ages ago, but maybe I'm just thinking back to early Coldplay experiences. It's a song by Coldplay called What If, which is as fitting as it gets. It is fitting because today's topic is a continuation of last week's discussion, which was about conditional reasoning mm-hmm. and largely how to think about it and approach it um, when and when not to diagram it. And so now we're going to extend that conversation and move into some of the more advanced forms of conditional reasoning that you see in both logical reasoning and logic games. So a song called What If, I think, is, again, about as close to perfect as we can get in this in this kind of constraint format yeah, we have. Yeah, it's immediately hypothetical, which is really what conditionality is about. And this is also, interestingly enough for us, a slower song. Mm-hmm. It's more of a ballad by them. So not even that's different. Because <laughs> that I prefer up-tempo, more <laughs> rock tunes. Maybe and, we both uh, just need to mellow. <laughs> We need to slow down in the heat. (laughs) Well, I can tell you Uh, this, if you want to extend that to maybe make it relevant. One of the things that I constantly tell people, whether in the early stages of conditionality or as they get into the advanced forms, like we'll see today, is take your time. You've really got to let this mellow a little bit. It's not going to be the sort of thing where you learn it overnight, where it immediately resonates and sinks in. This really takes a lot of practice. Yeah, I saw somebody today online was talking about the difficulty of doing conditional problems. And to me, it's like learning geometry at first. Mm. It isn't really something that most people are comfortable with. They have had minimal exposure to it, mm. even though in the real world, it's everywhere. You know, if you if you play pool, for example, it's all geometry. Sure. And it's the same thing with conditional reasoning. It's everywhere you go. It's in almost every conversation that somebody would have. Yet in a formalized sense, it is something that you're not as exposed to. And that really makes it challenging. We talked about that last week a lot. But take your time with it. Keep practicing because this is definitely a type of reasoning where the more you work with it, the more comfortable you will become. And it is definitely learnable. Yeah, I like that geometry analogy in a lot of different ways. One being that there are some formulas that will get you through this. And once you know essential formulas, we're going to talk about one today for uh, a specific phrase in conditionality that's just, it's gold. You're done. It will always solve things for you. It'll always at least have you construct your diagram in the right way. Yeah, and even the conditional indicator words that we talked about last week, they are basic rules that really handle a lot of this. I think that's a great point that you make right there is once you know the ground rules, that'll get you pretty far, and then you have to learn the nuances and how to manipulate it. Yeah, that's right. I I will say that when I was in high school and I encountered geometry, proofs were my enemy. (laughs) I don't think I got a good explanation up front, so I was always like, what am I doing here? And then the following year... When I'd moved up to, uh, I don't know what was next, Algebra Algebra 2 probably? Yeah, I think so. I was like, why did I find that difficult? And so I've often used that example when I'm teaching conditional reasoning is that first people encounter it and they're like, what am I looking at? 
And then sometimes a few months, even a few weeks later, they look back and they're like, oh, that's easy. Yeah. And that's that's what you get with, when you're preparing for the LSAT. It's, it's remarkable in a good way to watch the timeline, the evolution of a class over time. Because in lesson two, when you see conditional reasoning, heads spin. And by lesson six, when you're doing conditional reasoning in logic games, or lesson seven, eight, and you're deeper into this stuff, flaws in conditionality in lesson seven, for instance, just people breezing along, not a big deal. So yeah, they've seen it enough. hindsight in this can be a very rewarding thing, ultimately. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons you always go back and study that stuff sure. that you looked at at first to see whether it does look easy or not. But let's move on. Yeah. What, uh, what's what been going on in the LSAT world this past week? Well, we've got a slew of LSATs fast approaching this September, October, November. So people need to be keeping an eye on deadlines, to be sure. The October registration deadline is, I believe, September 10th. So yes, right about a month, about a month away, four weeks or so. Exactly. And I actually had an interesting conversation. I was going to let you make this point. Yeah. Yeah, LSAC uh, yesterday, which happened to be Monday, because there had been some uncertainty. They originally had suggested that you would be able to use a fee waiver that you get from the July LSAT. Cancel so if your score on August 28th. Yeah. Exactly. So if you recall, you cancel your score, then you get a fee waiver from the July LSAT only. That was part of the special deal that everybody was happy about. And... At first, it looked like, yeah, they'd allow you to use it for October. Then when people called them on the phone, they were like, no, can't do it. And so I reached out to someone that was not on the phone, someone, multiple people that were more in an administrative capacity. And they confirmed that yesterday, that indeed, if you register for the October LSAT now and then decide uh, that you're not keeping your July score and you get that fee waiver, you can get a refund in full for that October fee. So, Yeah, retroactive refunds fly. are somewhat of an anomaly over the years with this, so it's a bit of a gift. Yeah, they did it a couple times last year, but times prior time. to that, it's really, really rather rare. So I'm glad they made that choice. That was the right choice, sure. quite honestly. And um, once again, though, I'm hearing that they were caught off guard by the demand for October. Oh, and so, clearly, the biggest complaint that I've heard about October that relates to this registration deadline is there just aren't a lot of places to take it. I'm seeing exactly. it over and over. Somebody was saying the other day that the closest center was 530 miles away, and they, oh, they didn't live in Alaska. <laughs> what was the message I got on Twitter yesterday? I have to go to another country. <laughs> and I think they're going over the border from North Dakota to Canada or something like that. But that's still actually pretty aggravating to have to go that far away. If you're going to go to another country, go someplace where the paper test still lives. That's what I say. <laughs> and that is in yeah. Canada. If you need a passport, you might as well go to Europe. Yeah, but you can drive from know, North Dakota to Canada. Flying to another country is a whole <laughs> different financial commitment. Tell me about it. Well, the other thing that came up was another of their famous podcasts came out from LSAC, and that was Keeping Up to Data. Uh, this one clocked in at 5 minutes and 25 seconds in length, so we've probably already exceeded that just in talking about drinking. Talking about drinks. So this, this one is not full of a lot of great information or useful information for LSAT takers. It's they've, they finalize their application numbers. They have 100% of the applicant count in. The overall volume of, of applicants is up 3.2%, but applications themselves are down 1.5%. Yeah. So that kind of makes it look like there's more people applying, but they're applying to fewer schools, That's perhaps right. more tightly targeted. And We saw this that, coming as soon as they raised the, uh, the fees oh, yeah. for applications. Well, and also, you know, we're coming off a year where you could just take it repeatedly yeah, if you it. wanted to. So more people got into the pool, and that would make some degree of sense that they'd be there, but maybe not apply to as many schools as they target a few. That's right. There were also the usual LSAT information where the total LSATs administered were up 7.3 over the prior year. So we knew this was this case. The numbers inside that are not quite so clear or quite so rosy as far as uh, LSAT's concern, but mm -hmm. that's just, you know, I'm not going to belabor the point and go deeply into the statistics. I don't think it helps anybody at this point. We know if you're taking the LSAT, you're going to take it. If you're going to apply to schools, you're going to apply to schools. Honestly, what other people are doing only affects you in so far as like how many competitors do you have and how many competing applications do you have for a given school. Yeah, so seeing, it, seeing apps down just a little bit, it's great, man. Yeah. I don't know about you. One of the things I was kind of hoping they might 
at least allude to, if not explain, was where some of this repeat limit was coming from. I didn't know if some of the data might factor into that. I think maybe they saw it increasing. You know, we talked about it when they came out with it. I, I think largely it's related to uh, we know that we're giving at least 10 LSATs a year right now is the plan. And if, if they keep that up, and I'm not certain that they will, because that's a really that's high a lot, bar to man. sustain. But they know they're going to run into people seeing the same test over time, given the test reuse. Right. And that is not something that they want. And really, that's not something any test taker wants to have their competitors. For their neighbor, right. Yeah. They would love it for themselves, <laughs> but <laughs> they don't want the person sitting next to them to have that experience. So anyway, it's an interesting podcast. We'll link it in the um, the notes for this particular episode. But the first half is about the data. And after the first couple of minutes, they start talking about law school admissions stuff that is specifically for law school administrators. And we're not going to touch that because we don't have any interest in it. <laughs> Let's move on. All right. Let's get to the heart of the matter. The main event. Yeah, man. Conditionality part two. And as much as I love what we talked about last week, this to me, just I think maybe to you, is slightly more interesting because this is where the real success is kind of lives or dies, I think. Most people can get through what we talked about last week. This is the high hurdle. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Is it more interesting? I, I think maybe originally when I was teaching it was because <laughs> this is kind of like the meat of, of the approach and the technique. Like, how do you see things? How do you recognize them? What do you do with them? But over time, at least from, from my perspective, and maybe it's because I wrote the Logical Reasoning Bible, was I started to think a lot more about how do people learn these ideas mm -hmm. and how do they put them into kind of like a position mentally? Like, where is it in their mental architecture? I see. It's a good so, point. So, yeah, it's something that, at least for me, the last week's conversation resonates with me a lot because I feel like sometimes people get the wrong angle of attack on these on this type of reasoning mm -hmm. and that puts them way behind the curve in terms of learning it and understanding it and it creates this frustration and so a lot of what I said about last week had to do with you know how do you think about it right. how much work do you need to do with it what do you need to learn those types of things if you can absorb that and feel good about it and come through that really kind of unscathed, then this part is made a lot easier. To but be this sure. This is what you typically I would say that see. this is where the difficulty lives if you have a good foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, a the good difficulties foundation. everywhere. Yeah, forget yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually probably my biggest complaint when I see other you know, courses and sometimes is that they don't really – they gloss over mm -hmm. it. Where they're like, oh, conditional reasoning, it's great. It's if, then. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good start. But to me, the devil is in the details. And it is things like what we're going to talk about today that make the difference between somebody who's going to score 162 and somebody who's going to score 165. Yeah. You know, these kinds of seemingly small differences, but as we all know, three points at that particular spot on the scale, that could mean tens of thousands of dollars in scholarship money. Yeah. So this, to me, is where the real difference is. And if you can't come out of uh, you know, a course or a book and feel like, wow, they really covered conditional reasoning 100%, then you need to look elsewhere and, and find additional resources because it is way too important for both logical reasoning and logic games to feel any weakness whatsoever. Agreed. Yeah. So if you're struggling, last week's probably more for you. If you feel decent about conditional reasoning, but chains or more advanced constructions or some of the heavier linkage rules that you get in logic games, say, this is going to be right up your alley. All right. Let's dive into it. Where should we start? Well, I mentioned the formulaic nature of some of this before. Why don't we start with a formula? <laughs> uh, that, that, sounds, sounds, that sounds like unless to that me. sounds awfully dry, but it gets better. You know, unless is one of those interesting terms. Like last week, we we said just memorize the indicators, yeah. but I always put a little asterisk on four terms, and that that is unless, until, except, and without. And those four terms operate in more or less an identical fashion on this test. Uh, they all introduce conditional reasoning, and if you've never encountered it before, it's actually pretty challenging at first. Uh, and so one of the things that I did a long time ago is I created what I call the unless equation right. to handle this. And it is a two-step equation, really kind of a process, process that you're applying to, 
to any conditional idea. And you want to do the two steps or you want me to? Oh, you're rolling. You do it. Go for it. Uh, okay. I'm on at that. I mean, so, and take some credit where it's due. This was all you. Well, I don't. I mean, Whatever. look, you didn't invent conditional logic or anything, but this... I didn't? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, Socrates, but... <laughs> <laughs> Me and Socrates <laughs> sitting on the hill. And Socrates, drinking the uh... hill block. This is, uh, this is something that I think, at least at the time, was a very novel way to approach it that gave a lot of students a great sense of relief because it was so tangible. It was so physically um, a- applicable to something that doesn't necessarily feel inherently intuitive. It was a formulaic way to think about it. And as I said last week, when you can put something into a formulaic approach, you can stop thinking about it. Right. Once you know these two steps, you see it, diagram it, and it's over. Good night. And then I'm gonna after this, I'll talk about an alternate way to diagram these as well. So don't don't let me forget to do that. If you weren't going to, I was. So excellent. I think we're covered. And then I'll then I'll talk about why I think this one's better. Okay. But, I do want to hear that, but two steps, go. All right. First step is whatever term or idea or statement is modified, which is typically meaning that uh, unless precedes it, is modified by unless, except, until, or without. That by itself, without any modification, becomes the necessary condition. So, for example, if I see a statement, and I'll use our A plus in studying example from last week, that starts off, it says, unless a person studies. All right, to me, at that point, just having read that, I know that the necessary condition is going to be a person studying or studying would probably be the way I would reduce it. So that would be step one. Step two is you take the remainder, whether it's before or after that particular clause, and you negate that, which in unless statements typically means taking a not out. All right, so you negate that, and that becomes the sufficient condition. So I'll give, I'll give the full sentence here. Yeah. Unless a person studies, he or she will not receive an A+. And maybe I'll just use they from a pronoun standpoint and, <laughs> and not have to uh, distinguish here. I think that's easier. It's actually, oddly enough, something that I've thought about doing with the Bibles and probably will do in the next year or two is just remove all, pronouns, all pronouns from them. Yeah. It's just easier. So unless a person studies, they will not receive an A+. Plus. Well, person studies is my necessary condition because that is what unless is modifying. The remainder, they will not receive an A+. plus. I'm going to negate that. So I'm talking logical negation. That means I'm going to remove the not. And so that means they will receive an A+. plus. Well, I just reduce that to A+. plus, And thus, this example becomes sufficient condition A+, plus arrow over to studies or study, whatever study. you want to call it. And... The thing that I really like about this, and one of the, I think, the advantages of this particular form is that when you do this two-step process, you typically remove negatives from what you are looking at. So my sentence, unless a person studies, they will not receive an A+, that had this negative in it. Notice how I was able to turn that into a diagram that was all positive. Yeah, it starts with an event as opposed to a non-event. Yeah, exactly. So to me... That's pretty powerful and really helpful. It makes you go faster. It typically moves these statements into a positive frame. There is another way to actually diagram statements that involve unless, until, mm-hmm. except, and without. And that is to change out that word for the phrase, if not. Yeah. So wherever unless would be, you'd say if not or you know some version of that. When not, exactly. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. So. And you might have... Uh, you know, if this happens or this doesn't happen, then, you know, this is what occurs. And if you apply that to the example that we have, what you end up with is a double, is is two negatives, one negative on the sufficient condition and one on the necessary, because it would turn into if a person doesn't study, so if not study, then not receive an A+. And from at least my perspective, I hate diagramming statements where there's two negatives like that. Mm. Because immediately I think, why not just take the contrapositive and have it be, be positive? So instead of not study, arrow, not A+, plus, I would turn that into A+, plus arrow, study every time. And at least in my experience, and you can yeah. dispute this um, <laughs> if needed, is that people do much better when everything is in a positive or it starts with a positive 
as opposed to when both of them are negative or if it starts with the negative. Yeah, I agree with that. One of the things we touched on last week, of course, was the synonymity, the interchangeability of a statement and its contrapositive. They are the same thing. So ultimately, if you're considering it from both sides, you've just produced two versions of the exact same idea. But I, I definitely take your point. I think that's a really good argument in favor of it. Yeah, they mean the same thing. Sure. No, if you use if not, you haven't done anything wrong. But what you will typically find is that as you diagram those statements, they end up with more negatives. Whereas if you use the approach that we advocate, you'll end up with more positives. And I think this highlights something that um, sometimes people ask me about. They're like, wow, that seems complicated. You know, complicated. Why do you do it? I'm like, there is a reason. <laughs> and that's why I always say, it's like if you are uncertain about something in our courses or our books, go to Twitter, go to our forum, uh, go wherever you find us and ask us these questions because this is what we do. We explain sure. it. And there is nothing that we advocate that has not been considered. We don't just do it because, well, that's the way we've always done it or it sounded like fun. We do it because there is some type of demonstrable advantage. Sure. And if there isn't, we'll say so. Yeah, I'm free to admit when there is no method to the madness, but there tends to be. There tends to be. And this is a great example where it's like, I'm not advocating this simply so I could put a cool name like unless equation on it. <laughs> yeah, the equation produces A plus error study. The contrapositive, if not, produces if you don't study, you don't get an A plus. Again, they're interchangeable, but the A plus study is definitely a more powerful representation in most instances. Yeah, if you look at those two statements side by side, most people would much rather sure. see the A plus arrow study example and it would make sense. And if they saw the other one, they'd be like, eh, I got to think about that for a second with all those negatives. And they might be likely to just take the contrapositive in any way, meaning they did what, you know, they got to our point anyway. Right, right, right. So, well defended. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure I defended anything. I just kind of explained why. Well, part of the reason that I know contrapositives become so not only valuable, but particularly useful for people like us who think about this stuff a lot, is because it's often almost necessary, to use the term, to have a contrapositive in mind as different additional variables get mentioned. In other words, contrapositives are often very valuable if you have to start to connect terms and keep the arrows flowing all in one direction, which is a roundabout segue into an idea I want to talk about of chains. Yes. Lincoln. I knew you were going here with this, and that's a great Great connection, especially depending upon how they, they make the argument. But I'll follow your lead on this. So Follow my lead. Okay. That usually means you just take over, but fair enough. <laughs> Isn't it? Whatever. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, what we mean by chains are what happen when you begin to get repeated terms, repeated variables sometimes in games, uh, that then connect to other things or are connected to by other things. Multiple conditional relationships that include repeated ideas, repeated terms. And what this sometimes allows you to do, more often than not, is to take that connective idea, or that repeated idea, and put it as a midpoint, or some point, between the ideas that it's connected to. So if you had, for instance, A plus arrow study, and study is your necessary condition, and if the next phrase came in and said, well, if you study for that test, you miss the party, or whatever it is. If you study for that test, you're a nerd, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> then you could <laughs> then you could begin to take that new relationship that repeats a term and link it. Studies there twice, it can literally be duplicative in the sense that you could then have arrow to study, arrow away from study, and the end terms now have a relationship too. This is why, and I think this is more interesting than single diagrams, this is why I kind of like this discussion today. Chains are fun. Chains allow for way more inferences and they allow for way more mistakes. Chains are also really related to the law. You know, if you go back <laughs> deep down to it. Logic chains or? Yeah, well, <laughs> I didn't think about that, but yes, you are right. Well, I've been in them counts. more than you probably, so maybe that's why I thought of it. <laughs> you have been arrested more than I have, I believe. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, since I'm rolling on zero. Oh, uh, then yeah, I'm I, winning. I think you're way ahead of me. <laughs> but, you know, all kind of like. Stuff. All stuff. Yes, it was all harmless. Nothing, no big deal, just a yeah. little bit like loud and disorderly at times. Um, so I, th I think when you have these chains, you see this in the law all the time. Well, this happened, then this, this, then that. 
and they're able to build like these relationships. And a lot of times in the law, it's causality that the chain is is related to. But there are conditional relationships. And one of the greatest things that I remember from one of my students a long time ago at Berkeley, she'd gotten into law school and the professor said, if you're going to have this crime and you're going to convict somebody, you need all these conditions to be met. And this is actually a preview of what we'll see as, as the multiple conditions sure. that are coming. Um, and the professor went on to list I think like seven of the eight and then people were like, that person's guilty. You know, they can be convicted. And she was like, "Uh, uh-uh, they're going to go free because there were eight conditions and the eighth one hadn't been satisfied. And so the contrapositive was basically, it's not going to happen. And she explained that to the class. And of course, about half of them were like, yes, they knew that. But there were a bunch of people in there, and this was a long time ago, who really didn't know conditional reasoning. I think this was probably before I wrote the Logical Reasoning Bible too. And they were like, huh, they had to stop and learn the conditionality. So when we talk about things like contrapositives and chains of reasoning, it's not as if this is the last time you'll ever hear this. You may not use specific terms in law school, but the concepts will float around in there. And it can be really interesting when you realize, well, that's just a basic conditional statement. Right. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point. I've Thank never you. really thought about <laughs> I'm trying to like I'm giving you little platitude compliments. I don't mean it that way. I know you didn't. I'll defend it, buddy. Good way. job. You get a sticker. I do. <laughs> that little happy face. Um, there you go. So that to me is is chains, essentially, is always on the hunt for repeated variables, terms that are reused. And sometimes it requires a contrapositive. Sometimes it might have been something where, well, if you didn't get an A plus, and you need to see where that would take you from that study A plus contrapositive idea. You know, what the LSAT is trying to do here is to see whether or not you can make connections between ideas that are related. And I'll use just a more abstract example. Would you say related or would you say in this case very perfect synonyms or at least very, very approximate synonyms? I'm trying to use a word that captures the idea that you might have in, in the same argument something that says B and then later on not B. I see. That's what you meant. I thought you meant yeah. like A plus versus good grade. And it's like, oh, I don't know if those are necessarily. No, not that. I, I'll try to explain here. Okay. Let's see if I'm successful or not. And I'm going to go more abstract. I'm just going to use the variables A, B, and C Fair. to, to kind of go through this. And this may take me a second. So if you have the first statement and it is simply A, arrow, B, pretty simple. Could be any, and A and B could represent anything. And then you continue reading the argument and you see another statement that is B arrow C. Well, the test is checking to see whether or not you can recognize that B is present in both statements. And if it is, then you're creating a chain. A goes to B, B goes to C. We now have this long chain, A arrow B arrow C. And so... The thing is, is when they when they set something up like this, and I spent a lot of time years ago looking at all the variations of this, and I was like, I think this would probably drive people mad if I wrote up a huge summary of it. But the uh, the outcome is one of those situations where they can ask you a variety of questions, but most likely they're going to, if it's like a must-be-true question, mm-hmm. they're going to throw something in there like, what's the inference, which is A or O C. Sure. Uh, so we call that, you know, it's just a, a connective, but I often think about that as being like the transitive property in math, where it's like A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. Sure. If you have A arrow B, B arrow C, then you have A it's arrow the same C. It's thing. The difference, and this is a distinction we need to make, equal signs go in both directions. Yeah. Uh, so just because A tells you C doesn't necessarily mean they are, in fact, interchangeable like it would be in math. Again, that's a bit pedantic, but. You no, it's an excellent caveat to throw in there. Uh, but at least, you know, maybe that example will help some of you. Sure, like, oh, you I can see visualize it at least that way. And that A arrow C where you hop frog the middle term, leapfrog the middle term, it, uh, it works in reverse as well if you're doing contrapositives, jumping backwards. If you lose that final necessary piece, C in your example, it means all the stuff that depended on it, B and A, both go away as well. So yeah, you can it, work your way back and forth down these chains, jumping variable to variable. I think of those changes going downstream, like A to B, B to C. If something bad happens downstream, it reverberates back upstream. So if you lose C, then you lose B, then you lose A. Uh, It's a weird way to think about it, but it's probably some LSAT problem about fish that made me view it this way. (laughs) 
<laughs> Probably. And the, to be honest, if you had, let's say, just a, a premise set that was A R O B and B R O C, and they said which of the following must be true, your two answers are really either A R O C or not C R O not A. But the second is far more likely to be the correct answer there. It's a hard thing it re- to visualize, yeah. It requires manipulation. Now, let me kind of play to the example I talked about before when I talked about them being similar. Let's say your premise set is A arrow B and then not C arrow not B. So really the difference here is I've given you the contrapositive of what was my original statement, B arrow C. This is a great example of how they force you to recognize that there's a connection here because you've got A arrow B and then you've got not C arrow not B, you're like, what? That sounds different because I had B and not B. But if I take that contrapositive of that second statement, it returns to being B arrow C. And now I've got the same chain that we've just been talking about, A arrow B arrow C. Yeah. That's a really good point. The way I think about it sometimes, or I've explained it to students at least sometimes, is every conditional statement you get is really two things. It's its original and it's its contrapositive. If you get two conditional statements, you now have four things. And you've got to consider for each of those four single uh, single instances whether those variables overlap at any point. And that's why the contrapositive becomes so particularly valuable when you're trying to link things up. Now, uh, uh, which is a really great point and a good example of how the variation that they have in choosing how to present things. Notice that the example that we gave so far is really among the, the probably the simplest of them all. Sure. Oh, it's A to B, B to C, and then what's the conclusion? Kind of like the thing that I was thinking about years ago was all the different variations in simple argument structure. Because if you start off with those two statements and then you get your chain of A, B, C and your inference A to C, one of the things that you often see on LSAT questions is they'll give you a premise, A or B, and then they'll give you a conclusion, A or C. And they'll say, What's the assumption? Right. And now it becomes, interestingly enough, if you're, especially if you haven't thought about it before, it seems almost exponentially harder to be like, well, what is the missing piece? And I mean, we have various techniques we talk about with this, with, with different questions, and I'm not going to go deeply into those, but I'm still missing B arrow C. So I had premise A arrow B. I had conclusion A arrow C. That missing statement that I'd like to see is B arrow C or the contrapositive, which again becomes more likely as the correct answer because it requires further manipulation, not <laughs> C arrow not B. You see why and I said this was more interesting? Look at this. It, it is more interesting. It also, I feel like, moves into a degree of abstraction that somebody driving their car might be like, dude, I'm trying to read Just like... swerve off the road. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to read the road signs. I can't, I can't juggle all this. This is annoying. But if you really want to play with something and have what I would call a good time with logic, <laughs> with both people in the world who might enjoy this are like, all right, I'll do it. Um, start writing down arrow statements like that and see what happens. And almost cover up pieces because this is really the way some LSAT questions are made. They just take this exact relationship and then they take out statement one and they're like, all right, give us that for an assumption or take out statement two and give us that for an assumption or they take out the conclusion and they say, we're going to ask you what must be true. And so to me, there is a degree of formulaic aspects to this. One of the things they've done in recent years is they become much better at hiding this structure Mm -hmm. through kind of like language that's a little bit looser, at times more vague. One of the things I like about really the older tests is sometimes you can see this in such a clear fashion. You're like, look at that. It is this exact form and they've just done this. And at least from a learning standpoint, I love to start with those questions because students can read them, see them and be like, ah, it matches this abstract form perfectly. And that makes it more likely that when they get to newer presentations of this, that they cut through the vagueness and the fuzziness to see what is truly still underlying the problem. Yeah. Part of the simplicity of this, if you could call it that, is the idea that variables themselves, individual variables, it's really easy to spot when they've been negated. Contrapositives tend to be pretty self-evident if you practice with this. Language, on the other hand, ideas, on the other hand, the contrapositives of things become a little bit less immediately 
uh, obvious. The difference in saying somebody's traveling versus they're, they're at home. Those are actually contrapositives of another, or potential negations of one another. Mm -hmm. If you're at home, you're not traveling, that kind of thing. If you're traveling, you're not at home. But they don't sound in any way related until you start to think about negations immediately. You have a continuum yeah. of what the activity is. They're actually in the same, what are you doing, or right. where are you? Right, right. And that is, I mean, that Categorical is, contrapositives, really. Yeah, truly. That's a whole, that's a discussion that you could probably talk about for quite a long time if you really want to, like, deep dive something Who, at us? some point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> us. not us. Gee, we'd never do that <laughs> two hours on the July LSAT okay. later. Um, <laughs> the thing about chains is y you see chains with, say, three, four terms with some frequency in LR, not not every single test, but it is not an infrequent occurrence. You do see it in logic games a reasonable amount, especially three term chains come up all sorts of, of ways. So it's not something you can escape. And it, you really shouldn't feel bad about it anyway, because I actually think this makes it easier. I'd rather have one long chain of statements than multiple disconnected pieces, especially in a logic game, because that means uh, you know I can see implications and consequences in a game much more quickly when things are chained sure. together. So chains, in this case, uh, unlike prison, they are your friend. <laughs> I've been in them out of prison, too. It's not just that. I mean, could... <laughs> <laughs> not safe for work anymore. Yeah, maybe not. Let's move on. But yeah, I mean, to me, an arrow <laughs> creates a relationship. And the more relationships you can see in a logic game or a logical reasoning question, the more you know and the easier it is to tie pieces together. It's the Truly. disparate pieces in games that make me a little bit less comfortable. Yeah, that outlier piece where like it doesn't connect to anything. Yeah, what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see a, you know games just all about chains, and it's partially why I like sequencing because they are chains uh, in in a different sense than the conditional ones. In, that we're an talking ordered about. sense, as opposed to an indicative one. Um, chains to me are are the place where I do find myself diagramming with a bit of frequency. You know, I'm something of a diagram phobe, but I do. When it comes to chains, especially ones that are longer than just A B C. That, to me, is a place, and maybe there's some negatives thrown in, certainly in logic games I diagram, um, but in logical reasoning, this is the type of thing that would be a pretty good clue. If I can see clearly repeated terms, I tend to take a pencil out. Well, I think that's a smart decision. Two variables, you can juggle that mentally, and it doesn't seem that challenging. Three variables, now there's more going on, that's more to juggle. That's definitely a point where I say to myself, at least, I'm going to put that down on yeah. paper and stop juggling it, stop thinking about it. And sometimes, too, the, the nature of how conditions are introduced, unless being a good example, unless is one of those things where a diagram becomes even more complicated because you have this negativity that it's really not there. Yeah, it's in the sentence, but it's, but not, it's not actually in the how statement. You write it out as you begin. Which, by the way, is because the unless removes it. Right. That's the Yeah, the exception. key to those four words is that each of them represent an absence as opposed to uh, a presence. Yeah. Just to throw back to what we were talking about before. Sure. Sorry. Let's move on to another, I would say, really confusing statement for most people. Uh, one of my favorites to see on the test because I feel like I understand it completely. And so they're not going to put one past me. And that's either or. Mm. And this is, again, this is something where when you're preparing for the LSAT, you need to make sure that you are completely conversant with this idea and how it works. Because there is a separation between the way people view this term in the real world and the way it's actually used in logic and on the LSAT. See, on, in the real world, when we say either or, typically what we mean is one or the other, but not both. Right. And if you think about that, this, it's, this is one of the many examples I often use to show the differences between the LSAT and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Some the word sum being another one that I like to talk about in the same vein. If you think about the idea that in the day-to-day -day basis, you would use words like either or, and everybody would understand you perfectly. You would know what you meant, and there would be no confusion. And then all of a sudden, you go to take a test, which is clearly extremely important for your future, and they're using those really basic terms, in your opinion, in a very different way. Right. That's got to be a moment where you're like, mm, what else don't I know? What else, what are they, if they're doing this on the simple stuff, what's happening on stuff that, I, that I've never encountered before? Right. And I think that is a really good summation of why the LSAT and preparing for it can be really challenging. Yeah, the precision of language on this is 
exponential. It's like the word sum on this test too, which I think is another example of, I'm gonna call it common assumptions or common perceptions about day-to-day -day use and how the test makers don't adhere to it or don't have exactly. To. I I used to use when I would talk to prospective students, especially parents, they'd be like, "Well, it, it's just words," and I was like, mm -hmm. "What does the word sum mean?" Right. And they'd be like, what, what are you talking about? Everybody knows what that word means. I'd be like, all right, some of my friends are coming to the party. What does that mean? And people would typically say, well, that means a portion of your friends are coming. Um, not all of them. And I would say, not on the LSAT. If I say some of my friends are coming to the party on the LSAT, every single friend I have could come because the definition of some is at least one, right. possibly all. And that would floor people because they'd be like, what? And I'd be like, that's what I'm talking about with language. Yeah. That's why I've stopped asking to have some of your drink. You see, <laughs> you see right through it. <laughs> because you will immediately down it. Immediately the down it. <laughs> Whereas I just meant for you to have one sip, that's right. not all of them. Well, turning to either or, it's the same thing. Most people in the real world think it means one or the other and not both, but that's not what it means in logic. It's not what it means on the LSAT. The definition for the purposes of this test is that either or means at least one of the two, and quite possibly both, depending upon the conditions, which we'll talk about in a moment. Sure. So when you say either A or B, you're not saying that just one of them's happening. And that's a that right there is a is a big deal because you're allowing for both of A and B to occur. Precisely. It's not a, it's a minimum, not a maximum, basically. Yeah. It feels counterintuitive. It does. When you throw that out there. Um, interestingly enough, there are two ways they can kill off the idea of both of them happening. One is to use the phrase that actually says, but not both. So you see this in logic games a lot. Either A will attend the party or B will attend the party, but not both. At that point, because the definition is at least one, you know that either A is going and B is not, or B is going and A is not. Yeah. The other way they can kill it off is if there's some common sense piece of information that would preclude the possibility from occurring. The both possibility, yeah. Some yeah. situation that's naturally binary. On Tuesday uh, at 5 o'clock, I'm either in Chicago or in Minneapolis. And I don't want to hear anybody be like, but video conferencing, Dave, no. <laughs> so I'm talking physical presence, Physically. not a virtual presence. You're not going to stretch that far at 5 o'clock to get from Minneapolis to Chicago. Right. So the geography of that situation precludes that from happening. Yeah, it's either Tuesday morning or Thursday morning. Yeah. Can't happen. Now, this means that when you encounter either or, a lot of times because of their real world understanding, people want to say that, okay, if I have A, that means that I don't have B. Or alternatively, they'll say, if I have B, I don't have A. Is that right, John? In a real world? Well, you... no, on the L side. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were asking me if that's people's common assumption. And the answer is no. Yeah, and they assume that's how it works, right. but it doesn't. Because it is what you quite rightly said, it's a minimum. When you're diagramming something that involves either or, what you're really looking at is if you don't have one of them, you have to have the other one. So if you don't have A and you've got to have at least one of the two, that means B must occur. Alternatively, contrapositively, mm. if you don't have B because you've got to have at least one of the two, then you must have A. And so the diagram is actually um, really completely negation of what people expect. They expect to see A arrow not B. The diagram is not A arrow B. Yeah. That's usually a big wake up call for a lot of people when they run into this. So like it doesn't work the way I thought. I'm like, no, this is this is part of the value of actually preparing for this test. Yeah. And that's such a fun rule in games, especially grouping games with an in and an out set. Because it actually guarantees you something on the in group. If you have to have either A or B you know you've got a minimum inside. That's a great thing to be able to just diagram instantly. And it's automatic if you've practiced this and you understand it. It's confounding if you really don't get the idea. Yeah, a good example of that. Let's say you had nine variables and you were selecting five. And you get a rule that says either A or B is selected. <laughs> instantly, I'm going to reserve one of the five spaces for A slash B. One of them's going in minimum. Minimum. Now, but. it might be that the other goes in too, but a lot of times they'll say, they'll give you some 
you know, something else that'll, that'll cause chain reactions or problems. But you automatically know that you have a space reserved for at least one of A and B. And that is really powerful because you've now turned the game into a smaller mini event with only four open spaces, maybe three, depending on whether both A and B are there. But the fact that both could be there really um, removes the big assumption, the big mistake that most people in that case would make, where they think one's in, one's out. If you put one of the A, B, slash in your out group, you've made a mistake. That yes. doesn't have to happen. Yeah, the only reason that would have to happen is if they set it elsewhere or if they put a but not both in there. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself, would the test makers do something like that to me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they would. <laughs> if you've listened to this many episodes and you're still asking that question, get out of here. Uh, no, just listen. Re listen. Uh, that would be the better solution there. That It's a great example of how they have no problem trying to throw the ball past you. They don't mind throwing you a curveball to see whether or not you can handle it. It's their favorite pitch. Yeah, this is, this is something you see in games all the time where they're playing on the actual definition of words as they see it versus what they know you believe to be the case. This is how they help lower scores in a consistent way, uh, especially for people who walk in cold or who maybe only look at a test or two and don't have like the breadth of experience with the concepts. And it may sound like I'm repeatedly preaching the idea of you should prepare for this test. <laughs> you the are. truth is I am indeed pre preaching that. Rightfully so. Yeah. Well, you've seen it a hundred times where somebody's like, oh, I didn't know that's how it worked. And after that point, they don't miss that type of question again. I think I've seen it five or six times today. <laughs> you on the phone for like six hours tutoring yeah. so, and talking to other people. Talking to people. So, yeah, this is the kind of stuff where once you know it, you know it. And then it's uh, kind of behind you. These are boxes you can check. And really conditional reasoning on the whole is a set of boxes you can check. If you know the unless equation cold, you're going to get those questions right, or at least get that structure right. If you know how to do chains, put them together, make inferences back and forth, you're going to get those right. If you understand this particular non-assumption, minimum, not maximum, you're in good shape. And down the list we go, right? So Yeah, we're just checking things off that you can know before you walk in. And that to me, it's like reading the directions at the beginning of the section. <laughs> Don't do it. Know it beforehand. I read something online after the July test where somebody was like, I lost a minute reading the directions. And I was like, man, that's like on page two of our course and, and our books is like, don't read the directions, know it beforehand. You're killing yourself with that. Yeah. This wasn't the lost minute that we saw in a lot of instances where the proctor started to test while still reading the directions, right? <laughs> We're not going to have that, that conversation. Happens. It doesn't. It is, it is different. Okay. Let's move on <laughs> to... Uh, the next kind of uh, common topic, and that is statements that involve multiple sufficient or multiple necessary or both, or both uh, right. conditions. Although both is pretty unusual, actually. You know, think about that CD game from June 2000. That's a good example of where you see it I'd happen. Not. Yeah, no one really wants to think about it. But that's a great example where they threw in multiple conditions on both sides and said, have a nice day. Uh, no, you're not. Yeah. Think so, what we're first off, what we're talking about is statements where it's not just a simple A or O B, or to get an A plus you must study. It means that there are multiple conditions on one of the two sides, or again both. But we'll not worry about that for the moment. And that might be like to get an A plus you must study and you must work hard. So there are two conditions there. Uh, you can do that on the sufficient side as well. Uh, you know, to get an A plus and get public accolades, you must study. Right. It, it could be all sorts of different things. It depends on, again, as always, what the author of the problem actually determines to be uh, sufficient and necessary. But this complicates things because now what's happening is that you have more conditions floating around. And they tend to do something that I think is really what causes the issue they use different terms to connect those conditions. Sometimes it's and, sometimes it's or. Mm -hmm. And depending upon what they do makes a big difference. And it also makes a huge difference for the contrapositive that we'll talk about. Yeah, that so, example you gave before of eight necessary conditions or whatever it was and only seven were met, that's clearly an and situation, as we will see. Yeah. But if it had been an or situation, 
Well, let's take a look at it. Let's go back to the A-plus arrow study example. Uh, to get an A-plus, you must study and you must work hard. So I know that if you get an A-plus, both of those things happened. What if we changed it to or? You, you study or you work hard. Well, then I only know one of the two occurred, and I don't know which one it was. A-plus requires less in that case. Yeah. It just means that one of those two is going to occur. So as you're looking at that on either side, that and versus or difference is really critical. Yeah. I was just thinking that's a nice callback to the last point about either or, and it creates a minimum. An or as a double necessary in this case just creates a minimum. you got to have one. You may not have to have both. An and means both. And is collective. Or is individualizing. Yeah, it's separating it out into two completely distinct pieces versus you've got to have this jointly occur in our example. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing, at least to me, and in fact, I'll just I'll jump ahead Do to it. this idea that we had talked about, is there are two very special conditions that I think really play a big role in logic games, particularly. One of them is if you have and in the necessary condition, and the other is if you have or in the sufficient condition. And we'll link to some blog articles that I wrote a while back on these two particular topics. I'll also say, just real quick, I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, Dave, but um, there was a, if you're one of our course students, whether you're a full-length course or one of our live online courses, I did a clinic, I believe, in week three, so it's been a few weeks back, on this exact idea, a full clinic, diagrams and everything. So if you want to check this out further, this was a big part of that discussion on conditional reasoning. Go check that out. Yeah, and that's for course students only. Yeah, sorry, that's private. But... Yeah, so if you're not a course student, please enroll now. <laughs> All right, so... There are benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Membership has its benefits, as American Express would there you go. Uh, so famously say. <laughs> uh, but this, the idea of and in the necessary condition, if, if you see a rule that says A, arrow, B, and C, what, you're, what they're really saying is that when A occurs, you're going to get B you're also going to get C. And one of the things I've always thought is what that really means is you have two separate rules. You have a rule that says A or O, B, and you also have a rule that says A or O, C. Right. Now, some people prefer to draw them out separately. I don't personally because it's, I mean, I just see at the end and know what the relationship is. But that can be a great way to simplify that particular idea. I tend to draw that side of the arrow for what it's worth vertically. So that if there is a chain that branches off from an individual piece, I can keep the thing going. So for me, it would be A arrow and then B above an and sign or plus sign above a C. Yeah, that's a 100% agreement there. I don't write it out like on a single line where right. that whole statement is. It would take up like three lines <laughs> because the, the B plus C that's over on the necessary side would be done vertically. Yeah. For the exact reason, they might shoot some arrows off B yep. or C. B to D, and now I can draw that really easily and keep the chain going. And no A gets me to D, etc. Exactly, and see how that relationship works. The other relationship that I often see that I think about as being broken into two parts is when you have or on the sufficient side. Let's say you have D or E arrow F. Well, in that case, if you have D, you have F, and if you have E then you have F. And so, you, again, you have two completely separate statements if you choose to draw it that way. And this is one of those things where it's really a matter of personal taste. If you said to me, no, I want to make it one big integrated statement, I'm like, I'm all good with that. On the other hand, if you're like, no, I want to draw it separately, it's clearer to me, I understand it, again, my response is have at it. Sure. There's, it's whatever is most efficient for you. There's not like an obvious advantage depending upon you know, which approach you take. Yeah. The way I've sometimes framed this is and statements on the necessary side tend to produce more outcomes. They tend to be more powerful and lead to more certainty. Or statements on the sufficient side tend to lead to more outcomes and produce more certainty. It takes less with an or sufficient to do stuff and you get more with an and necessary once the chain starts. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that description and I endorse it wholeheartedly. Hey, hey. So the last thing that we see with the multiple condition statements, that is probably the challenging part, is taking contrapositives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where people run into uh, some trouble. This, this is one of those things where, again, I always just say, memorize what happens <laughs> and do that for a while. And then 
when you're not studying an individual question, think about why it happens the way that it happens. And the rule is this. When you are taking contrapositives of statements that involve and or or, you negate the terms, and what was and, the word and becomes or, and what was or becomes and. So that's the simple approach to it. That is simply the way that it is. There is no variation from that. There's no special kind of thing you need to think about. I have not given it a trademark name like the and or equation. Although maybe I will now. I was going to say. <laughs> you put it out in the world now. You Nobody can use somebody's, that. <laughs> somebody <laughs> started to the claim. and or approach. It's nice uh, that it's that simple though. I mean, it, it makes sense underneath it. But if all you do is just memorize the formula again or the technique, you're good. So let's look at an example. We'll go back to the A plus arrow. You have to study and you have to work hard. Perfect. Well, if you don't study, you're not going to get an A plus. Or alternatively, if you don't work hard, you're not going to get an A plus. Either one of those two not happening will stop that A plus from occurring. Do you have to have both of them occur? No. Or both so of them you, fail or both of them lacking? Really yeah, both of them not occur, I should say. Good catch. When I take that contrapositive, it becomes not study or not work hard, arrow, not A+. Plus. In other words, and there's so, two events that could prevent your A+, plus in that case. Yeah, so I negated both terms. Yeah, that was easy. Either. And then I just changed the and to an or. I'm off to the races. And when you go from sufficient to necessary and do that, it's the same exact process. And becomes or, or becomes and, negate all terms, you're done with it. Yeah, if it was A+, plus study or work hard then A plus only needs one of the two. So losing one, the relationship could still exist. Exactly oh, that right. guy's lazy. He didn't work hard. Yeah, but did he study? Because he could still get that A plus. There you go. In an or necessary. Which, again, is why the or necessary is not all that powerful, or at least not as revealing. To yeah, it lowers the bar. Just got to have one. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one. I don't have, it doesn't give you any information. There's no odds. It's not like 80% that one and 20% that one. It's just one of the two. To stretch this one level up, get a little more high-minded, chains off of an or statement like that are very uncertain because you don't know which direction you're going to flow. Well, if he studied, again, he skipped a party. If he worked hard, again, you know, he's raised in a good home, whatever. You wouldn't know that A-plus told you the party or the household. You wouldn't know any of this. You didn't know if you because went down Because the that or path. leaves it uncertain from the jump. But if you had the and, uh -huh. you'd know everything. Both occurred and you could keep going. Yeah, the A plus would tell you four things if the branches had chains. Nice. Yeah. Now, again, if this feels a little in the weeds, and listening to it, it might. Uh, if this was all more visual, I think it would be a little clearer. And it's visual in courses, of course. Uh, yeah. No, it's in study. books, too. Yeah, it's in the books. It's everywhere. Um, study. This is why it's important to go back and review this stuff. And then it becomes pretty simple. I don't want anybody, I guess, Dave, what I'm putting it on here is a disclaimer of like, if you're having a hard time seeing all these constructions as we talk about them, um, either listen to this again or just know that these constructions exist in other places. What we're trying to do is tell you essentially how the operations that underlie them work. Yeah, and it also depends on what kind of learner you are. If you're an auditory sure. learner, you're probably just processing this Crazy. and you're very happy. If you're a visual learner, this is going to be more challenging. But we've tried to use examples that are pretty easy to understand or relatively simple in their construction. We hope. We hope. I'm sure we have. I think we have. We're going to let it go. Let's move on okay. to actually the last of the kind of like more complex statements that we're going to talk about. That would be double arrows. Double arrows are kind of interesting because you don't see them all that frequently. They are, they're relatively rare. If you've ever taken a logic class, these are called biconditionals. And essentially, the diagram for a biconditional is a double arrow. Mm -hmm. The conditions go both ways. And at least from a definitional standpoint, each term is sufficient and necessary for the other term. So if you have A double arrow B, A is sufficient to make B happen. And then also A is necessary for B to happen. Yeah, because B points back at it. Let me put yeah. a quick asterisk on this. You mentioned before as you started this uh, nice discussion that these were fairly rare or uncommon. Let me say, as a, again, disclaimer number two, in logical reasoning, these are fairly rare. 
you see these a fair amount in games. A block, for instance, in a game with a group is really a double arrow. Um, True. So if you're starting to see some double arrows in a game and you're panicking because we told you they're rare, relax. <laughs> they happen a lot there. But in logical uh, reasoning, they are very uncommon. Yeah, you see a lot more double knot arrows. Uh, in games, yeah. Yeah, but regardless, your point is well taken there. <laughs> I didn't want somebody to look down at three double arrows in a diagram for a game and be like, oh, I must have missed something here. <laughs> They're out there. <laughs> and, you know, that idea, that kind of double arrow idea, to me, it's really, it has all these names and it looks kind of complicated, but it really means kind of two things. Either A and B are always together or they're never together. Mm -hmm. So it's like going to a party and if you have a double arrow with Anne and Bob, A and B, if you see Anne, you know that Bob's at that party too. And if you see Bob, you know Anne's at that party. But if you look around everywhere and one of them's not there, then the other's not going to be there either. That's right. They're, they're that really... couple who's just always together. Ah, yes. That was exactly where I was going with this. <laughs> It's a couple that everybody loves to hate. I can't go without my boyfriend, girlfriend, what have you. And so that is something where it's like it's very powerful, though, because there are so few outcomes with a double arrow. It's either they're there, both of them, or neither of them are there. Two outcomes only in that kind of scenario. The beauty of it is, to be honest, that if there is a several – there's a set of – fairly easy to recognize and powerful statements that introduce this. If and only if is probably the most notable of those statements. Yeah, I'd say that's the most common. But there are also a whole host of variations. If, but, only if. And I remember the first time I saw the LSAT do that and I just stopped for a second. I was like, you tricky people. You're trying to like throw everybody off who's already learned that if and only if is a double arrow by rephrasing it in a way that you haven't done before. There's one that I've suggested they'll use at some point, if, yet, only if. Yeah. And you've talked about when and only when. Sure. When, but, only when. You know, if and when if both and when being the same thing. The, basically the same word for our LSAT purposes. Any one of those phrases, immediately I see it, double arrow. Yeah. Yeah. I love double arrows. They're so powerful because it's completely codependent. There is no independence in a double arrow relationship. It's that couple that that's, never is apart. I knew you were going to come back to that. And you're right, frankly, that's what it means. The <laughs> trick with regular single arrows is there is independence. And people don't like to acknowledge it. Necessary conditions, they're free to do as they please until something grabs them. Here, exactly. these two just, they're holding hands forever. You know what? It reminds me of something I read earlier today about uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Oh, boy. That uh, <laughs> some of their friends have stopped inviting them to dinner parties because they refuse to follow protocol and sit apart. They instead always sit next to each other. They just ignore the seating plan. And then they have a bunch of PDA during dinner. It's, just, it's annoyed some people who are like, the protocol is we sit apart and, you know, conversation is improved. Oh, that's kind of sweet, right? So... Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are a biconditional. They're a double error. You didn't see that coming. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> didn't. Although I get, I get his impulse to, to do what he's doing. I got a low-key okay. crush on her, man. You do? Yeah, a little bit. I don't know that I'm a big fan. I like uh, Catherine a little bit more. Oh, you, you went classy and I went American. Good for you. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> Actually, uh, some well, psychiatrist would peel that layer back and the next one and the next one. Uh, sure yeah, someone will write us and be like, Dave, you have deep-seated problems. Yes. John, yours are deeper. <laughs> <laughs> They're worse. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things when I look at that if and only if statement, what I often tell people is to break it apart. If you have A, if and only if B, well, the and is giving you two pieces. So you really have two separate statements. The first statement is A, if B. And the second statement is A, only if B. And they're both occurring. Now, stop for a minute and think about what that is. What is the diagram for A, if B? Because about 30% of the people I ask this question to get it wrong. They think, well, A came first, so it's A or B. No. The if modifies B, so the diagram for that is B arrow A. All right, so you got B arrow A operating, and you also have A only if B. Only if introduces a necessary condition, so that diagram is A arrow B. So we got B arrow A and A arrow B 
Now we have our arrows pointing to both of the terms here. That's how we get the double arrow out right. of this. So it's not just a fancy term that we made up. There's an actual reason underneath for sure. why we would create it that way. If you take the contrapositive of that, you once again get not A arrow B and not B arrow A. And that also works. Yeah. So you could have not A double arrow not B, and that is the same biconditional here. Indeed, indeed. These, by the way, just because you're hearing repeated variables, doesn't make a chain because it's only two variables that are repeated. B and A, B and A. So a lot of people, when they look for repeated variables, are like, but where does it lead me? It leads you right back to where you started. The chain is a circle here. Exactly. That's now, a good way to put it. You go to A to B, and then you get to B, and you're like, where am I going? I'm going back to A. You get over to A, and you're like, where am I going? Back to B, and it just goes around and around. Endless loop. Endless love, just like uh, Prince Harry. And do you think they'll last, by the way, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle? You know, I, it occurs to me now I said I had a crush on her like I know anything about her. I couldn't speak with the least bit of authority on either one of them. Okay. I wonder. Did myself. you watch, watch the royal wedding? Um, didn't it occur at like four in the morning? I think I saw the I clips of it afterwards, but... The fact that I knew there was one is about as far as I can take it. <laughs> Sorry. If I was a... Well, I am a betting man. Uh, if I was to bet on this topic, I don't know if I would give them a permanent over and under of yes. I might take the under on that. If you're a just betting man know. and bet on marriage permanent, you're a fool. Well, yeah, just statistically. But royal weddings are obviously under a completely different set of pressures and expectations. But we saw what happened with Charles and Diana. There was Andrew and Fergie. There's been a lot of problems. And there you go. So, well, this, was, say, yeah, no. this is quite the tangent, but I don't mind it. It is relevant, I think. Whether part of part of this to me, the struggle of looking at things in such dry, such cold clinical conditions is they don't always resonate. But if you can an like analogize these, I suppose, to things that make more sense or feel a little more real world, I think it helps them to sink in. If you can see this biconditional, it's like, oh, these are two people who just never leave each other's side. Maybe you picture over each yeah, other. a ginger and some gorgeous woman. Then there you go. Well, I said last week that I tend to look at variables as people. And you know, yeah, the way they act is if almost in a very personalized sense. Sure. This is a great extension of that particular idea. Chain flowing downstream, as you used earlier today. It's, uh, it does help, I think, to have an imagination about some of this stuff. It makes it easier when all of a sudden they're talking about power plants and electrical generation and random stuff that I don't really have as much of a feeling about. Whereas, you know, reality TV or, or the Royals, I, I can visualize that and, and kind of like make it happen. So, yeah, well, there you go. It's a good point. Really, all of it comes back to the idea of you got to practice this stuff. You have to understand it. You're doing yourself a massive disservice if every single idea that we've covered in these two episodes isn't at some point clear to you prior to test day. Because these are conquerable ideas. You will see them. And when you do see them, if you know what you're doing, it's, it's a gimme. It's a free point. If I see conditional reasoning on this test, it's a lock. Exactly. And you will see it on your test. And I would say this, if you're just starting out studying and you listen to this conversation like, mm, some of that stuff didn't sound right, you're going to encounter it, or at least you should. But if you're listening to this and it's a week before the LSAT and big portions of this were like, what are they talking about? Then you need to hit the books fast <laughs> because you are behind the curve compared to a number of people who were, you know, scoping out those scores in like the 160s and the 170s that you're going to be competing against. This is the stuff that you can and should know. This is incumbent upon you to learn and to master. It's an expectation that the test makers have. It will help you in law school. It'll just make you a more rigorous thinker and analyzer of people's statements. And I will say, you know, one of the most common things that we hear is, I did not realize how many mistaken reversals and mistaken negations I hear on the evening news or in the newspaper <laughs> or my friends have made them. It's driving me mad. I'm like, yes, welcome to LSAT preparation in the LSAT world. We're all a little crazy. <laughs> Well, I won't argue with the last part, at least. I think that probably sums up the entire day pretty well. <laughs> All right. That is it for our episode today. We hope you enjoyed it. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube, or any 
where else you may find it. Give us a rating as well. And if you have any questions, you can send them to LSAT at powerscore.com or LSAT podcast at powerscore.com. John's behalf and my behalf. <laughs> have a great week. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you.